All hail the King of kings and Lord of lords, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, and hallelujah to the highest, the heavenly Father whose throne is in heaven. Starting off with Psalm 61, lead me to the rock that is higher than I, to the chief musician upon Neginneth, Negina, a psalm of David. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou has been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Selah, fall down and pray. For thou, O God, has heard my vows. Thou has given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Thou wilt prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. O prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. This is Psalm 61. This psalm will have fit many occasions in King David's life when he was distraught from fighting his numerous enemies. He offers his petition, verses 1 and 2, express his trust verses 3 and 5, and prays for prolongation of his kingship, verses 6 and 7, and offers a vow of thanksgiving to be delivered when God answers in verse 8. So today we will be coming out of uh, various scriptures of the word of God. Turn with me in your holy Bible to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. We're at verse 21. Genesis 2 21. The making of woman. Amen. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Ribs. It may mean rib or side of the ark, a building or leaves of a door. Here it would mean from his side. Or from his ribs to convey the plural number. Verse 23 indicates it probably involves flesh and bone. We have verse 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto man. Brought her unto man. Here a loving father presents the bride to the man. That's what's happening here. You see? As you also see in 1 Timothy 2.13. Let's go to 1 Timothy 2.13. 1 Timothy 2.13. For Adam was first formed. Then Eve, as you see, you see Adam was formed and then you see Eve is taken from the rib of Adam. That rib also being as well symbolically for ribonucleic acid or the RNA, which is the, the, the messenger DNA, which sends the messages from the DNA. It, it travels and carries the DNA, the RNA, rib. Ribonucleic acid as well. Verse 23. 
And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Ye shall be called woe man. Woe unto man. Ye shall be called woe man. Because she was taken out of man. After noticing all the animals. Adam now at long last. This is now this time. Finds that which corresponds to him, the close association of the man and woman is conveyed by their names. Since she is called woman, woman, Isha, the Hebrew is Isha, I-S-H-A-H, because she was taken out of man, Ish, I-S-H. Adam's act. Of naming his wife reinforces his leadership and authority over her. God's naming in chapter 1 and 219 in verse 20. Verse 24. Therefore shall a man lead his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh amen therefore indicates a reasoned conclusion in light of Adam's joy at finding a mate leave here the man leaves but note Psalm 45 10 and 11 Cleave is a strong verb meaning join. You see? It means to join, stick to. The two verbs leave and cleave may be subordinate, subordinated in the following way. Let a man forsake or abandon his father and his mother in order that he may cleave unto his wife and in order that they may become one flesh if he does not leave he cannot cleave nor can he become or be one flesh this is the strongest Hebrew construction to indicate a change of state. The verb to be. Hayu. H A Y U. Hayu. Plus the preposition Li. L E. The process of becoming one flesh totally, totally, totally united in life, purpose, and pleasure is presented. Note the change of state in verse 7. You see? God's ideal plan for marriage is one man for one woman for one lifetime. Amen? God's pattern for marital happiness is evident when man loves and leads his family with children who obey and reverence their parents as you see in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 with a wife who respects and supports her husband's leadership as you see in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 21 through 33 a mutual supportive attitude must characterize both husband and wife if they are to succeed in building a harmonious home 
Marriage is so important in the mind of God that it was the first of three divine institutions and was patterned to illustrate Christ's love for the church. Christians should therefore do their part in contributing to the success of the family. Amen. Amen. You see, Adam was the first man and the forefather of the entire human race. He lived a total of 930 years. He was created in a state of innocence and in the image of God. He was also created with the appearance of age, with a high level of intelligence, and with the ability to communicate with God. When he and his wife Eve fell into sin, as you read in Genesis chapter 3, they brought the curse of sin on the entire human race. Adam also appears in nine references in the New Testament in regard to his headship over the human race. As you see in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. Verse 25. And they were both naked. The man and his wife were not ashamed. They were not ashamed in their nakedness. Naked, not ashamed. Their outward nakedness was a sign of their integrity. They lived and moved without guilt, shame, or fear of exploitation or threat. Naked in the Hebrew sounds like the word subtle or subtile. In Genesis 3.1, thus tying the two chapters together, Satan will concentrate his shrewdness on their integrity. Have you seen it? Amen. May God be glorified. Now follow me in your scripture. We're going to turn to 1 Corinthians. You see how Psalm 61 talked about vows, which corresponds and correlates with marriage. Because when you marry, you exchange what? Vows. In those vows, you say for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, for sickness and in health. Amen. Till death do you part. Marriage was always between a man and a woman, never between a man and a man, never between a woman and a woman. And it was for one man and one woman for one lifetime. Amen. So now turn with me in your scripture to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 7. I visited this several times already, but you have to keep on being diligent and steadfast in the word of God. Day and night, we must meditate in God's word, meditate in the laws of God. Only then will we become successful. Joshua 1.8. Amen. So, these are the problems of the married and the unmarried. Amen. Now concerning the things. Whereof. 
ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman that is not his wife, you see? Because thus it will be leading to fornication. And that's something that we should flee from. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Flee, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are brought, bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We were bought with a price because Jesus Christ laid down his life. Amen. He paid the ransom. That we may be washed through his blood. Amen. Fornication is, is something that defiles the temple of God, which is the body. The body is the temple of God. Your body is a temple in which the Holy Spirit dwells. Know ye not that your body are the members of Christ? Huh? Shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. What know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. You see? Amen. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman unless she is your wife. The commandment is be fruitful and multiply. Leave your father and mother and cleave unto your wife. Not cleave unto a harlot because when you cleave unto your wife, y'all become one flesh. So will you become one flesh with the harlot? God forbid. Now concerning this recurring formula indicates that Paul is dealing in turn with the issues the Corinthians had raised in their letter. Good, morally good. Matthew 17, 4. Let's go there. Matthew 17, 4. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and behold, a voice of the cloud which said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased hear ye him the apostles does not intend to teach that marriage is morally wrong as compared with celibacy is clear from verses 2, 7, 9, and 26. As we also read in Genesis 2, 18. And we can recap that again. We, we started out with Genesis. Let's, let's go back there swiftly and quickly. Just to reiterate it. Genesis 2, 18. Says, and I quote. We're rightly dividing the word of God. And the Lord God said. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. 
And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to all fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help me for him. Thus comes the making of woman. Amen. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate for him. So it was not good for man to be alone. God saw that. That's why he prepared the woman for man. Amen. Amen. Romans 7. 7 4. Let's, let's go to Romans 7 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Amen. Marriage is an undissolvable, undissolvable, excuse me, indissoluble union is indissoluble. Marriage is an indissoluble union, which in general is broken only by death of one of the partners. That's why we say in death do you part for sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer, for better or for worse. Through the believer's identification with the death of Christ, he is now free from the law, but joined to Christ to bear fruit unto God. Amen. Marriage, the union of marriage can only be broken in death. It does not even matter if you divorce your husband or divorce your wife. That union can truly only be broken in death. That is the word of God. Amen. Even when you go to Malachi 2.14, let's turn. We're rightly dividing the scripture. Malachi 2.14 Turn with me in your scripture Malachi 2.14 And we're going to take it down To verse 16 Yet Ye say wherefore Because the Lord hath been witness Between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant you see yet ye say wherefore because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, the wife that you married when you was young, the Lord hath been a witness. Jehovah was the witness to the wife of your youth, the wife that you married as a young man while she was a young woman. And you're supposed to grow old together. Amen. The Lord Jehovah hath been witness between Thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. You didn't treat her well. You didn't treat her good. Yet is she thy companion? Isn't this your partner? And the wife of thy covenant, the one that you exchange vows with, 
Verse 15. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit? And wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed? A seed of God? A child of God? Therefore, take heed to your spirit. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. And let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Protect her with your life. Verse 16. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. He hateth divorce. For one covereth violence with his garment. Saith the Lord of hosts, the heavenly father, therefore take heed to your spirit. Check yourself before you wreck yourself that ye deal not treacherously. Amen. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Hallelujah. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words. The things that you have said, you have defiled yourself. Causing you. Pain in your stomach. You have defiled yourself. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet ye say, Wherein, wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them? Or where is the God of judgment? Hmm? God will judge you. For it says in Hebrews, marriage is undefiled in the bed, but adulterers and whoremongers will he deal with. Amen. Marriage in the bed is undefiled. Verse four of Hebrews chapter 13. Marriage is honorable in all, in the bed undefiled. Whatever you and your wife do in the bedroom, sexually is between you all two, you two. Marriage is honorable in all, in the bed undefiled. But whoremongers, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. God will judge. Amen. Turn with me. Proverbs 518. We're rightly dividing the word of God. Proverbs 518. We're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Proverbs 518 Come on, come on, bear with me Bear with me, I'm turning these pages in the scripture Breaking down this word Proverbs 518 Let thy fountain be blessed And rejoice with the wife of thy youth Let thy Fountains be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. When my wife divorced me, it broke my spirit. But I deserved it. Because I sinned against her and before God. But the Lord is merciful and faithful and he redeemeth us. He chasteneth us. He chastised us. And he buildeth us back up. And just because she may have legally divorced me. Spiritually, she is still my wife. Under God, vows and oaths were said and exchanged. Amen. 
I did not have the support of my family like I would have. They were my own family members telling me that I should divorce my wife because of the things that we went through. Majority of it was my fault. I take the blame for it. See, the one thing that is merit for divorce is sexual immorality. When you commit adultery on your spouse, the Lord Jesus Christ said that was reason for divorce. When you go into Matthew 5.32... Let's just be honest. Be honest with yourself. As the, the great reggae artist culture saying. Be honest with yourself. We have to be honest with ourselves. You can't lie to yourself. And the, the spirit of the Lord searcheth all things. You can't lie to the Holy Spirit. You see? Matthew 5.32 But I say unto you. That whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Verse 31, 531, Matthew. It hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. This is Jesus speaking, the Lord Jesus Christ. But I say unto you, verse 32, Matthew chapter 5, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. So if you marry a woman that is divorced, you are committing adultery. She's divorced. You can't marry her. You cannot marry a woman that is divorced. It's adultery. It's adultery. Amen. And what did Jesus teach on adultery? Ye have heard that it was said by them of old. Thou shalt not commit adultery. This is one of the Ten Commandments. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish. And not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Amen. Thou shalt not commit adultery was the demand of the Old Testament law. Jesus goes beyond this outward command to reveal that it, it's an act is the result of the inner attitude of lust. Whosoever looketh characterizes the man whose glance is not checked. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. By holy restraint and result in an impure lusting after women. The act would follow if the opportunity were to occur by taking his listener beyond the outward statement of the law to its real intention. Jesus was trying to get the listener's attention off the physical and unto the spiritual. You see? The responsibility of divorce is clearly laid upon the one seeking the divorce. 
The responsibility of divorce is clearly laid upon the one seeking the divorce. Whosoever shall put away his wife without biblical basis causes her to commit adultery. Thus, the divorcer brings about an unjust suspicion upon the divorcee. Amen? It hath been said is again a reference to the Old Testament commandment of the Mosaic regulation, Deuteronomy 24.1. The normal custom of the ancient Near East was for a man to verbally divorce his wife. In contrast, the ancient law of Israel insisted on a writing of divorcement or certificate of divorce. This written statement gave legal protection to both the wife and the husband. Jesus explains elsewhere, Matthew 19, 8, that Moses' concession was not intended to be taken as license. The only exception given by Christ is for the cause of fornication. The Greek word, porneia, like the word pornography, porn, meaning sexual unfaithfulness. This was the only reason or the only exception given by Christ for divorce was for sexual unfaithfulness. These Statements make it clear that adultery or fornication is a legitimate ground for divorce. Adultery and fornication was the only legitimate reason for divorce. However, the legitimacy of the divorce does not necessarily establish the legitimacy of remarriage. However, the legitimacy of the divorce does not necessarily establish the legitimacy of remarriage. Scripture never commands that one must divorce an unfaithful wife or husband. On the contrary, there are many examples of extending forgiveness to the adulterous offender. Genesis 38, 26, Hosea 3, 1, John 8, 1 through 11. Hosea was told by God to marry a whore so God could show that he is married to the backslider, which was Israel, who went a whoring after other gods, worshiping false gods. God had his own prophet marry a whore, take the wife of a whore, just to make an example out of Israel. Amen. The responsibility of divorce is clearly laid upon the one seeking the divorce. My wife was the one who's, who was seeking the divorce. So the responsibility of divorce is clearly laid upon the one seeking the divorce. Whosoever shall put away his wife without biblical basis causeth her or him to commit adultery. Thus, the divorcer brings about an unjust suspicion upon the divorcee. The basis of Old Testament swearing or oath taking is found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12, and Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21. To forswear means to swear falsely or perjure oneself. Oaths taken in the name of the Lord were looked upon as binding and perjury of such oaths 
was strongly condemned by the law. By the time of Christ, the Jews had developed an elaborate system of oath taking, which often formed the basis of actual lying. In other words, there were stages of truth and thus also a falsehood within the system of taking oaths. All such oath taking Jesus announced was unnecessary if one were in the habit of telling the truth. It was no need. Thus his command was swear not at all. This does not have reference to cursing as such, but to oath taking. The disciple is to speak the truth in such a way that his yes means yes and his no means no. Let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. That's it. That's enough. Your word is your bond. When you say yes, make sure that is what you mean. When you say no, make sure that also is what you mean. Mean what you say and say what you mean. Anything that is more than a simple affirmation of the truth cometh of evil. Amen. Amen. So jumping back into the scripture. Amen. I think that we are at verse two. Of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. You see? Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Amen. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband and likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Verse five. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And come together again that Satan tempt you not for your inconsistency. You're not supposed to withhold yourself from your wife or your husband sexually. You give yourself unto your wife. You give yourself unto your husband sexually. Unless you are fasting or in prayer. You see? Or maybe you may be sick. Because this will be the reason that Satan can tempt your husband or your wife to go cheat because you're sexually depriving them you see verse 6 but I speak this by permission and not of commandment Paul is saying that he's speaking these things by permission you you know you do what you as you please with your husband or your wife but I, I'm speaking this by permission this, this is not a commandment but this is this is one who you know is filled with the Holy Ghost verse 7 for I would that all men were even as myself. Paul was celibate at this time. But every man hath his proper gift of God. One after this manner and the other after that. You see, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 7. A spiritual gift is a sovereignly given ability to minister to others in the power of God. With an evident manifestation of the Holy Spirit through the Christian as he serves God. Such gifts are sometimes identified as enabling and task gifts. The enabling gifts of the Spirit are given to all Christians and include faith. Romans 1.11 
1 Corinthians 12, 9. Knowledge. 12, 8. Wisdom. 12, 8. And discernment. 1 Corinthians 12, 10. These gifts help the believer to use his specific tasks, gifts. These motivational gifts include prophecy. Romans 12, 6. 1 Corinthians 14, 3. Teaching. Romans 12, 7. Exhortation, Romans 12, 8, shepherding, Ephesians 4, 11, showing mercy, Romans 12, 8, ministering, Romans 12, 7, helping, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, giving, Romans 12, 8, ruling, Romans 12, 8, governing, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, evangelism, Ephesians 4, 11, hospitality, 1 Peter 4, 9. Some would add to this list martyrdom. 1 Corinthians 13, 3. And celibacy, Matthew 19, 11, and 12. Every Christian has at least one spiritual gift, as you see in verse 7, and may have more. The Apostle Paul apparently had exercised every spiritual gift. Christians should use their gifts to serve God in some area of ministry that calls for the gifts they possess. Luke eleven thirteen, Romans 12, 3 through 8, and Ephesians 5, 18. Verse 8. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows. It is good for them if they abide even as I in celibacy, which is a gift of the spirit. Everyone can't be celibate. It's a spiritual gift to be celibate. Verse 9. But if they can, cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. You see? If they cannot refrain from fornication, it is better for them to marry than to burn, burn in hell or burn with the passion and the, the desire to to want to to want to make love or, or, or to want to copulate. Amen. And unto the married, I command yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. No doubt the apostle has in mind explicit instruction of our Lord recorded in Matthew 5, 32, 19, 3 through 9, Mark 10, 2 through 12 and Luke 16, 18. Let's go to Mark chapter 10. Mark 10. 2 through 12. But let's go to Luke 16, 18 first since we'll turn backwards and hit Luke before we hit Mark. Amen. Coming from 1 Corinthians. So that's Luke 16. Luke chapter 16 verse 18. We are rightly dividing the word of God. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marry another committeth adultery. And whosoever marry, marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. You see, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ said. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tight tittle of the law to fail. So the law is still in effect, but we are not living under the law. We're living under grace and truth. When you live with the Holy Spirit, you're not under the law because the Holy Spirit will convict you and keep you away from fornication and keep you away from various sins because you'll be chastised by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. But it doesn't mean that the law is done with. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass. Then for one, then one tittle, one vow, one dot 
of the law to fill. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. You divorced your wife and then you went and married another? That's adultery. That's why Will Smith is suffering the way that he's suffering with Jada Pickett. His first wife, he divorced his first wife and married Jada Pickett. That was wrong, you see. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. And let's go to Mark chapter 10. Jesus on divorce. And Jesus answered, verse 5, and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote this precept. Let's, let's actually go back. Let's, let's read that whole chapter up to verse 12. Jesus on divorce. We're coming out of Mark chapter 10. And he arose from thence and cometh into the coast of Judea by the farther side of the Jordan. And the people resort unto him again. And as he was one, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation God made them male and female for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh and then they are no more twain but one flesh what therefore God have joined together let no man put asunder and in the house his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Have you seen it? Glory be unto God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. We at verse 11. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried and be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, verse 12, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Verse 13. Don't put her away means divorce. Let him not put her away. Let him not divorce her. Verse 13. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Not the Lord. This is not to be taken as marking a contrast between inspired scripture and what Paul is about to say. On the contrary, while on earth the Lord explicitly gave instructions about marriage and divorce as we read out of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. However, he did not make any special reference to the case of a mixed marriage. Although you see, Ezra caused some of the Israelites in the Old Testament to divorce their strange wives. 
mixed marriage means maybe a black man and a white woman or vice versa. Thus, it is incumbent on the Apostle Paul under inspiration of the Holy Spirit to give additional instructions regarding this kind of situation. Amen. For the unbelieving, verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Is sanctified. This is not to indicate that the children of the spouse of a believer are automatically born into a family of God. The words holy and unclean in this text are equivalent to sacred and profane. The apostles thought has Old Testament antecedents. Haggai 2.11-13. Let's go to Haggai 2.11. Haggai. 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 Unfaithfulness reproved. We're coming out of Haggai. Haggai. Chapter 2, verses 10. Starting at verse 10. And the four and twentieth day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, Shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. Then said Haggai, verse 13, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then, verse 14, answered Haggai and said, So is the people and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord. And so is every work of their hands and that which they offer there is unclean. You see. The people were asked the priests two questions and as a result would learn that holiness is not communicable. While unholiness is communicable. The Mosaic system clearly taught that ceremonial cleanliness or cleanness was not transferable from one person or thing to another, but ceremonial uncleanness was transferable. Leviticus 6, 18, 22, 4 through 6 and Numbers 19, 11. Verse 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Amen. Amen. Verse 15. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such case. But God hath called us to peace. You see, God is the God of peace. Amen. Amen. He is the God of peace. Depart 
is the middle voice and is almost a technical term for divorce. Bondage, there is no conflict here between Paul's advice and that of our Lord in Matthew 5, 32. The point is that the divine standard cannot be imposed on the unregenerate. There is nothing the believer can do but submit to divorce. There's nothing you can do when your partner is divorcing you. All you can do is submit to it and pray to God about it and give it your burden unto the Lord. That's all you can do. Amen. Verse 16. For what knowest thou, O wife? Whether thou shalt save thy husband. Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Only God knows. Your wife may be saved through you, through your commitment to Christ. Through your commitment of the commandments of Jehovah. Who knows? Only God knows. Amen. For what knowest thou, O wife? Who knows? Whether thou shalt save thy husband. Or knowest thou, O man? The lights just turned out while I'm reading, but I can still see. Whether thou shalt save thy wife. You see, the heavens is, is paying attention. The heavens is listening. May the Lord have a blessing unto the reading and preaching of his word. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Verse 17. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so ordain I and all churches. 18. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be uncircumcised. Verse 19. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Verse 20. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it, but if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant, the lights just came back on. You see how God works in mysterious ways. A certain point, there's a certain point that I'm reading out of the scripture that the light went off. The light went off at verse 16 where I said, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? The lights went out. Then the lights came back on. At verse 21 and 22. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be free, use it rather. Verse 22. This is where the lights came on. For he that is called. And, th and then the lights came on. For he, verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 22. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant. Is the Lord's free man. Likewise. Also he that is called. Being free. Is Christ's servant. I'm a free man. My wife may have divorced me. But I'm still got to serve the Lord. You see. That don't mean oh. Go running off trying to get married. To another woman. No that's not what that means. For now I'm a bondsman in Christ. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's free man. Likewise, 
Also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Amen. Ye, verse 23, ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Don't be the servants of men. Be the servants of God. Verse 24, brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. Abide under the shadow wings of protection of the almighty. Abide with God. The prescription for peace and holiness and marriage is to remain in communion with God. Whether you're married or whether you're not married. You should be in constant communion with God. Amen. Now concerning virgins. I have no commandment of the Lord. Yet I give my judgment. As one that have obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. Virgins. Again Paul is about to deal with another subject. But which the Corinthians had written him. No commandment of the Lord. And our Lord's instruction regarding marriage and divorcement reg recorded in the Gospels. There is no record of his speaking directly to this issue. Verse 26. I suppose, therefore, that this is good. For the present distress, I say that it is good for a man to be so. Present distress. This expression is probably best understood in light of 1 Corinthians 15.30. Let's go. 1 Corinthians 15.30. And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, die daily. If after the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. You see? I die daily. This does not teach that Paul mortified the flesh every day. The context tells us that he, in effect, faced wild beast every day. Paul's life was in such constant jeopardy that he never knew when he might be called on to give his life for the gospel. You see? Verse 26, let's recap that. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for man so to be. You see, Paul had already experienced intense persecution and no doubt anticipated it would get worse. History records all too well that he was right as Paul was beheaded. <clears throat> Amen. And it talks about all those that was beheaded for the gospel. They should receive the crown of glory in Revelation. Amen. Verse 27. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loose. Seek not divorce. Art thou loosed from a wife? Are you divorced from your wife? Are you, are, are you, are, are, are you separated from your wife? Seek not a wife. Verse 27. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. You see? Don't go looking for another wife 
just because you have been loosed from your wife. You have been divorced from your wife. You have been separated from your wife. Give yourself unto Christ. Save all your love for Jesus. I have a song. It's on the next project. Saving all my love for Jesus. It's coming. The track list so far is 13 songs. Ink Pen Guardian volume 13. It will come out this year. Verse 27. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. You're bound unto your wife. By vows. That's your wife. Why are you trying to seek to be loose? Why are you trying to seek to be divorced? Art thou loosed from a wife? Are you divorced? Are you separated from your wife? Are you loosed? Only in death do you part. Seek not a wife. Verse 28. It's better to be celibate at that point. And to be a bondsman in Christ. It's a blessing. Verse 28. But. 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 And if thou marry. Thou has not sinned. If you, if you choose to marry, it's not a sin. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. But I spare you. Trouble in the flesh, the Greek term, philippusis. Philippusis. Probably indicates that Paul understands this trouble will not come from within as though marriage would necessarily be accompanied by turmoil and distress. Rather, this trouble would come from without. This fits well with his emphasis on the persecution and trouble confronting the church at that time. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. But I spare you. Verse 29. But this I say, brethren. But this I tell you, brother. You can't have one without the other. Love in marriage, love in marriage. That used to be a song, a theme song for the opening show, Love in Marriage. Uh, character Al Bundy, and his wife was named Peggy. He used to sit on the couch with his hand in his pants, looking very miserable. You see where they took this verse. But this I tell you, brother, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives... Be as though they had none. You see? Though they had wives, be as if they had none. As a bondsman in Christ. Many men, warriors, had wives and had to go to war for their country. And it was like they didn't have wives when they went to war. Because they didn't know whether they was going to die or not. Some never made it back. You see? But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. Verse 30. And they that weep as though they wept not. And they that rejoice as though they rejoiceth not. And they that buy as though they possessed not. You see? One day you may be rejoicing in your happiness. The next day you may be full of sorrow. Tomorrow is not promised. One day you may buy some land. The next day you may not even be able to see your land. You see? Or possess it. Moses never made it into the promised land that Israel possessed. It was Joshua and Caleb, the men of that generation... Who were able, the only men of that generation to go into the promised land. That's my middle name, Caleb. Also pronounced Caleb. Verse 31. And they that use this world 
And I'm in the promised land right now. Ghana, Africa. And they that use this world as not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passeth away. But I would have you with out carefulness. He that is unmarried care for the things that belongeth to the Lord. How he may please the Lord. You see, when you're not married, you don't have those problems of pleasing your wife when she is unhappy. All you have to do is serve God. Amen. Verse 33. But he that is married care for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. You see. But he that is married care for the things that are of the world. You're married. So you have the distress of having to please your wife, how he may please his wife. Verse 34. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord. That she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world. How she may please her husband. Verse 35. And this I speak for your own profit. Not that I may cast a snare upon you, but that, but for that which is calmly, that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. You see, Paul's argument here is not that the unmarried, excuse me, that not that the married life is less spiritual than the celibate life, but that the celibate life is less spiritual distracted by worldly cares hence the single man or woman enjoying greater freedom therefore enjoys greater potential in terms of service to the Lord you see the focal point of Paul's advice is the promotion of faithful and undistracted devotion to the Lord amen Verse 36, we're coming out of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 36. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncommonly toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and need so required, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. Nevertheless, verse 37, he that standeth steadfast in his heart having no necessity, but hath power over his own will and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin doeth well. Verse 38. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. It will help in understanding this passage to remember the control the father had over the marriage of his daughter in ancient times. The virgin referred to is an unmarried daughter. You see? Verse 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to marry to whom she will only in the Lord. So even if you are divorced from your husband or divorced from your wife, the wife is bound to her husband until he is dead. So she is not allowed to marry unless her husband is dead. Thus, she shall be a chaste woman. Maybe go into a nunnery and become a nun and give herself unto the Lord as they did in ancient times. A lot of women became nuns after divorce or after their husband 
may have died when they became a widow. They became nuns. You see? Verse 40. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the spirit of God. I think, you see, the Greek word is dokio. Does not suggest doubt in any way. 1 Corinthians 12, 22. Galatians 2, 6. The phrase is better translated, I consider also that I have the spirit of God, meaning the Holy Ghost. As Paul was saying, he's given this sound judgment by having the Holy Ghost. You see? Amen. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading, teaching, and preaching of his word. Moving right along. We're going into Ephesians. I'm not done with you yet. The Lord is not done with you yet. We have some more scripture. We're going to come out of Ephesians. Chapter 5, starting at verse 22. Marriage is symbolic of the church. Amen. Amen. Marriage is symbolic of the church. Wives, submit yourselves. Verse 22. Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. This is comparative. This is a comparative clause. But in Greek, there are two different types of comparative clauses. You have elucidation, which means that wives are to give their husbands the same unquestioned, absolute submission they give Christ. Amen. Would this apostle accept wives to render the same submission to imperfect husbands, imperfect husbands, they give to their perfect Lord when other apostles recognize the periodic need for believers to obey God rather than man Acts 5.29 if the wills of human and divine authorities clash it is better then to take the comparative clause as that of emphasis, which means that wives are to submit to their husbands as submission rendered by them truly is submission rendered to Christ himself. When the wife yields her will to that of her husband, she yields to the Lord provided the husband's directions are in the fear of God or in line with God's will verse 23 for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of of the church and he is the savior of the body you see you see the word for the definite article gives the reason for why verse 22 calls for wifely submission just as Jesus is the divinely appointed head or authority over his church. In the same way, the husband is the divinely appointed 
head or authority over his wife. And he is the savior or protector of the body. As Jesus is responsible to provide for the welfare of his church. So the husband is responsible to protect his wife. In both cases, the responsibility to protect is inseparably linked with the responsibility to provide spiritual leadership. Verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. The extent of the wife's submission to her husband is in everything. That is, in every area of life and in every issue that may arise, those which the wife may agree with and those which she may not. Again, in everything is limited only to those directives of the husband that are in the fear of God. That is those conforming to God's will. Amen. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You see, the marital responsibility of husbands is to love your wives. The Greek word rendered love is Agapo, agape, which denotes the willing sacrificial giving of the husband's part for the benefit of his wife without thought of return. As Christ gave himself for the church, so there is to be no sacrifice, not even the laying down of his life. That a husband should not be willing to make for his wife. Amen. Verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. As the word sanctifies, purifies and cleans and cleanses. Amen. This verse may be paraphrased. That he might perfectly sanctify the church having cleansed her by the gospel accompanied with the washing of water baptism when will he perfectly sanctify the church when he returns for her in glory when was the church cleansed at conversion how was her conversion effected by the gospel, the word, and what ritual is to be associated with one's conversion? The washing of water, that is water baptism, which is the outward symbol of an inward change. You see? Verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The ultimate purpose of Jesus' love for the church is to present her to himself as a chaste bride, as a man once a sexually untainted virgin as bride. So Jesus wants his church to be without moral flaw. Verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. This verse 
develops the idea introduced in verse 27 that sacrificial love benefits the giver as well as the receiver. The church certainly profits from Christ's love. Verse 26. In that she is granted salvation. But Jesus also benefits from his love in obtaining her as a pure bride. Verse 27. Similarly, the husband who loveth his wife loveth himself. That is, he profits from this love as does his wife. Verse 29. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord, the church. You see? For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. The assertion of verses 28 that the husband who loves his wife loves himself is substantiated by Paul's reasoning in verses 29 through 31. As the church is a part of Jesus' body, verse 30, so is the wife a part of her husband's body, verse 31. Thus, when the husband loves her, he loves himself. As a man who cares for his body benefits himself, verse 29. So, the husband who loves his wife brings much profit to himself. Verse 31, leave his father and mother. A husband and wife have better chance for a successful marriage if there is some independence physically, emotionally, and financially from parents and in-laws. You see? This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church nevertheless let every one of you in particular love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband amen the bride of Christ you see the relationship of Christ to his church is illustrated by that of a husband to his wife. Christ is called the bridegroom and his wife is called the bride. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify, cleanse, and glorify it. In the Old Testament, several brides are typical of the church including Eve, Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, 24. Rebecca, Genesis 24, 1 through 7. Asenath, Genesis 41, 45. And Zipporah, Exodus 2, 21. The Song of Solomon is often interpreted typologically of the union and communion between Christ and and his church as wives should be submissive to and reverence their husbands so Christians should submit to and worship Christ amen amen the theme of submission mentioned in verse 21 of chapter 5 of Ephesians is now taken up and developed in detail from the church in general to the Christian household in particular. Accordingly, submission authority is treated in three domestic relations. That of 
wives and husbands in verses 22 to 33. Children and parents, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. And servants and masters, Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. May the Lord have a blessing unto the reading of his word. This was marriage is symbolic of the church, the problems of the married and the unmarried, and the making of the woman. Now we'll have the benediction. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, power, dominion, and majesty, both now and ever, as the people of God say, amen and amen and amen. Go with God.